Um, <clears throat> one thing is I'm not a typical speaker. I'm not podium. I don't like this thing. I move around. I'm going to move around as much as I can, and I guarantee you I'll probably yank myself off the stage here. <laughs> but if that happens, I got some seals up here. They'll help me up. I am a ranger. Can you? You guys will help me, right? <laughs> Thanks, bro. Um, if you all need to get up, use the bathroom, go ahead, it doesn't bother me. If you want to get, get more food, it doesn't bother me. Uh, I honestly don't even see y'all the majority of the time when I'm up here. I just kind of lose myself in the moment. <clears throat> but uh, I'm going to go for about, I don't know, an hour, maybe. If I'm boring you, there's, there's doors, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> And uh, I, I, I'm not very politically correct, so I'll say things that might offend you. And again, if that bothers you, you know, help yourself out the door. I, I, I could care less if that bothers you. Especially up here in the Northwest, I really want to offend you. No, I, 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 I was stationed up at Lewis, so believe me, I understand. All right, well, I'll get started. Yeah, and just go through the night. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about a lot of uh, a lot of things that went on. Some things you may not know, even after all these times, all these reports, everything that have come out, even with me and, and Oz and Tig out there talking, there's still some things that you may not know unless you've seen me talk before. Um, so, you know, if you walk out of here, you're probably still going to be a little angry. I'm sure a lot of y'all that have seen the movie were a little angry when you walked out. Rightfully, you should be. Um, but you also hope you're inspired a bit to uh, understand that there are still guys that, and it didn't make a difference which branch of service we were in. We didn't care. We were all brothers. That we we're willing to overcome obstacles and have faith in each other and, and give up our lives for each other. And Ty and Glenn did. So, um, well, I'll get started. Let, let's just get rolling. My name is Chris again. I was with the 2nd Range Battalion. I had a real good team. Ty Woods. He was a SEAL Team 6 guy, also was West Coast SEAL before that, White Soft, vanilla guy, I guess is what we call him. And then we had Jack Silva, who was also a West Coast SEAL. And then we had uh, D.B. Benton Boone, my, my best friend. He was a recon Marine. Be a Marsoc guy now, so if you want to go anywhere. And then we also have uh, Mark Oz Geist, Marine, and John Tick Tigan. So basically you had two SEALs, three Marines, and then you had the Ranger that really held it, everything together. <laughs> I'm just saying that for this table right here. <laughs> but see, that's what's funny is that if this was a marine table, they'd be like, Rrr. Seals, they laugh, because we seals have that same sense of humor rangers do. We just got this, this unpolitically correct sense of humor that we like to banter and make fun of each other. It is, it's, it's, it's great, it's a good, but it builds camaraderie, it does. But that team, no, I'm, in all seriousness, that team was fantastic. Now, we didn't work together in any other contracts. I, the only one that I'd worked with before for many years, well, I'd worked with Bub, but Bub came over later from Tripoli, was DB, was Boone. Him and I had worked together for 10 years, and he was my best friend. But everybody else, we'd never worked together. And you could just tell that that was, the team was supposed to be there. God had that team there. Because even day one, a guy would come in, it was one of those teams where you could look at a guy and he would know what you're going to do, know what you wanted to have done, know what you're going to say, and he'd go do it. You'd have to talk to each other. And I've only been on a few of those teams that were like that. Jeff's team wasn't that team. I had to tell him everything. I was like, guys, come on. <laughs> that was a real good team, too. No, that was. That was one of the best, one of the best teams I've been on with as well. But... It, was, it says a lot for the special operations community. It says a lot for Navy SEALs. It says a lot for the Army Rangers. It says a lot for uh, MARSOC. That it did make a difference. We all may have been trained in different uh, branches, but when it came down to it, the tactics were the same, the mindset was the same, combat mindset was the same, and the, the brotherhood was the same. And, and I saw that a lot as a contractor. I did, did contract for 10 years before I went to Benghazi. I've been deploying for 10 years before Benghazi. And then I was having so much fun after Benghazi, I went to Yemen after. We'll go more than that. Well, <clears throat> that day leading up to that time frame, 9-11-2012, you know, Benghazi was typical. It was similar like any other Middle Eastern country where you'd want to buy a timeshare. You know, there's people shooting guns up in the air, things blowing up. Uh, always an assassination attempt on somebody. 
Um, you know, and then there's snap checkpoints that just pop up out everywhere. So as you're driving down the road, there's a 50 cal in the middle of the road from a from a technical a truck pointed at you, and you got to stop. And hopefully, you can talk your way out of it because there's no government there. And it's fun. It is. It's exciting. It's enjoyable. Um, it is. People are like, oh, that's what. No, it is. It's really enjoyable. You're you're up on this level all the time, on every normal activity, just a normal day. You're up here, and it's fun living up here all the time. It is. Well, as 9/11 came, myself and Boone and Ty, actually it was about two weeks before 9/11, we were supposed to go home. Now people don't know that. People don't know that myself, Boone, and Ty, again, Ty died that night, we were all scheduled to end our deployments, so we were going home two weeks earlier. Now, we got word the ambassador was coming in. We knew he was coming in. Now, that team, like I said, was fantastic. So we were asked by our team leader, hey, will you guys stay and help out? The team is, is gelled. The team's awesome. We don't want three new guys coming in with an ambassador. And Ambassador Stevens was no, level, no low-level ambassador. If you want to compare it, Ambassador Stevens is a three-star general. He's up here, way up here. And he's coming in with two guys. They have some, some military experience into one of the worst places in the, in the world at that point. The most dangerous places in the world. Now, I'm not saying the other GRS guys, Global Response Staff guys, which is what we were, wouldn't have been just as proficient tactically as we were, because they were good. It's just that team had that camaraderie, had that gel. And so when our team leader said, hey, will you guys stay longer? All of us said, yeah, sure, we'll all stay. Cost Ty's life, but that's how it is. It's war. But we made that decision. And I don't think that was a coincidence. I know God made that, really made that decision for us. Well, as that day's going around, 9 11, myself and Boone are on QRF, we're on Quick Reaction Force. Now, these are things we take for granted in the States. Now, some of you guys that have been overseas, you understand what I'm talking about. You know, you, you know that just normal things here can get you killed over in the Middle East, North Africa, or wherever else, these great countries, Afghanistan. So we have a team that's on QRF that's on standby all day to help the other guys out if they're out on operations. Now, GRS is fantastic because we get to go out and do things very low profile. I never wore armor. I, I never had an armored vehicle. Never did. Because you wear armor and you kind of stick out. I mean, we stick out enough as it is because we don't have scurvy and we actually eat right. So you have these big, you know, you're already big guys and you don't want to stick out anymore. So we have a team that's on QRF. So if there's a flat tire in town, you go out and help. Flat tire gets you killed out there. If there's a little car wreck in town, you go out and help. Car wreck's gonna get you killed. Get you in a mob, get your arms pulled out of your socket. So me and Boone are on QRF all day. So we're monitoring what the teams are doing as they're doing their ops all day. We're on standby. Why that's important, why I'm telling you this, and this is really important, is because myself and Boone are also monitoring all the activity going on in town with a little map. We have a little map on our computer. I can't tell you what it is because it's classified. I guess if I put it on a server, somebody can probably have it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not real happy with that woman. Um, <laughs> We also have a little map board, and, and if there's anything in town, let's say a protest, let's say a mass gathering, let's say there's an IED, a VVID that blows up in town, or there's an attack, small arms fire, we have it marked. So as a team is going out on their operations and they're making their planning, they're doing their planning, they're doing their route planning, looking, oh, where should we go? Okay, we gotta meet here, this area is unsafe, let's stay out of it. I'm gonna tell you that board on 9-11, 2012 was blank. There was nothing. Day's good, nothing is happening. Well, at 9 p.m., so I'm just kind of skipping along here. 9 p.m., I hear Ty and I hear Tig coming back from doing a reconnaissance of an area the ambassador's gonna see the next day. Now, I want you all to keep in mind, I really didn't reiterate this as much as I should. We are not State Department. We did not have any allegiance to the State Department. We were not controlled by the State Department. We were CIA. We gave our word that we would help the State Department because the ambassador was coming into a situation where he did not have any protection. So I hear Ty, Ty's coming back from doing a reconnaissance on an area called the American Corners, an English speaking school. The ambassador's gonna go christen the next day. And I hear him say, Dave, Dave, we're gonna stop by and check on you. Dave, we've been a State Department officer. 
when you watch the movie, he's played by the African American gentleman in the movie. And, and Dave was pretty solid, solid State Department officer. Well, I hear Dave say, Ty, everything's good, and Basher's in his bed going home. No, there's a reason why we would check on him, and I'm going to go into it a little bit more. And it's kind of part of the story as well. You know, Ambassador's flapping. Ambassador's three-star general. Ambassador's on a nine-acre compound, consulate. Ambassador's on a nine-acre compound that has a terrorist organization living on it with them. 17th February Mars Brigade. That was who the State Department decided in their infinite wisdom to contract <laughs> as their QRF element for the local militia without doing proper vetting. All right? There's a scene in the movie and it, it, the movie we consulted on the entire thing from the script writing all the way to the completion. We were heavily involved with the entire process. But there's a scene in the movie where Pablo Schreiber, who plays Tano and is by far the best actor in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, he is, really. <laughs> well, he's on a diving board and we, we're doing a side assessment of the consulate. And we were, we'd done a side, we were doing a risk assessment, going around looking. And there's a scene in there where he's on a diving board and and he says, you know, M4s are not enough. These walls are soft. Terrorist organization living on the compound with you. You guys, this is sniper's paradise. And I remember asking him also, I said, hey, what do you have? I said, where are your machine guns? And I remember Dave and Scott looking at me going, we asked for them. They told us we couldn't have them. It's like, roger that. <laughs> I said, you guys, if you get attacked by any big element, you're all going to F and die. I said that verbatim. I remember seeing Scott's eyes coming about right here, and I thought, damn it, Ranger, front lobe filter, he's not. Bring it back in, you gotta tone it down. Bring it down, notch. And that was that day that we swore, the team, not just me, GRS team, Ty, DB, Jack, uh, Oz, Tig, we swore that if they ever needed us, we'd help them. And we gave radio communication with them, so we gave them radio. Now, that means a lot to it means a lot to soldiers, seamen, airmen, but it definitely means a lot to the special operations guys. But we gave our word that we would always be there to help them. So I, as I continue on, I just want you to know that as we're sitting there waiting to go and hearing them say, we need you, how hard it was and how disheartening it was and how it was hurting us every minute going by. Well, anyway, let me get back to 9-11-2012, 9 p.m., Ty's driving by, Dave says, everything's fine. Ty says, I'm going to check. Actually, Ty comes in and says, I skipped a little bit. Ty says, we're going to check on you. Says, Dave, we're going to stop by, make sure you're okay. And Dave says, I remember hearing on the radio, Dave says, Ty, everything's fine. Ambassador's in his bed going home. So Ty drives right in front of the consulate, 9 p.m., no mass gatherings, no protests, and goes back to the, goes back to the annex. I remember I'm hearing him say, break, break, Tom, everything's good. We're coming on home. I said, Roger, I'm bringing him home. So he comes home. Drives in. As he's driving in, I look at Ty, go outside to see what's going on, just to get a kind of get a little AAR from him doing his little after action report from him doing his little recon. And I said, Hey, how's the city look? And he says, It's good, dude. Everything's cool. Fine. Another day down. Let's get this day over with. And he goes and puts his keys away. It's 9 15. And 9 32, this is where it starts to get fun. 9 32. And I remember 9 32 because I remember I looked at my watch. Or look, because I don't like to be bothered at night. After being 10 years overseas working as a contractor for the State Department, CIA, and whoever else was out there, I was pretty salty. I was like, just leave me alone. I don't know what I'm doing. But 9.32, we get a call from our team leader, GRS team leader, staff guy, and he says, we need all GRS in the team room. And I remember Boone looked at me and he said, what'd you do? <laughs> now, Boone's been with me for 10 years. Now, like I said, I'm not politically correct. I'm going to tell you why I said this. And also, there's a reason why there's a scene in the movie uh, if you watch the movie, watch it closely again. You'll see where me and Boone are watching Tropic Thunder. Have you ever seen Tropic Thunder? Great movie, right? That's the reason it's in there. Well, the reason Michael put that in there is because what Tano would do to all these case officers that would come over, every case officer that comes over, every one of them is, they're very highly educated, very intelligent, very young, very unworldly at that time. But they graduate from their colleges, they go to the farm, train at the CIA training facility, come over to these areas, and every one of them is Jason Bourne. I swear every one of them is, they all bend bullets, they all jump over cars, every one of them is, no, Tom said, no, you guys are not, so it's time to play ranger games with them. And I, I had this little placard. Now, there's Sergeant Cyrus O'Malley in Tropic Thunder, that Robert Downey Jr. plays his character. 
And there's a picture I had where he's looking like this. And at the bottom it says, never go full retard. So I had laminated that thing. So when a CIA case officer did something that I thought was, I don't know, say, I would put it on their desk. And Rangers love to get everybody else in trouble. So I love misery. So I knew if I got in trouble, all the SEALs and all the Marines were going to get in trouble too. And I love that. Boone had been with me for 10 years, so he knows. He's like, that's where he said, Tano, what'd you do now? Because he's pissed. He's like, gosh, dang it. But I remember I looked at him and I said, man, I ain't done anything, bro. I've been sitting with you all day. I've been watching Al Jazeera, and Al Jazeera gets information quicker than the CIA and NSA sometimes. They're very good. I'm not kidding. And we're also watching Battleship which is the second greatest movie I've ever made inside 13 hours. No, it's actually, it's horrible. It's a movie. <laughs> but we're watching Battleship. And that's when 30 seconds later, we do get a call. And this one's urgent. And you can hear in the voice. You've been doing this for 10 years. You know by the sense of urgency in the voice that something's going on. And I remember my team leader says, we need all Jiro's in the team room now. <laughs> a lot of urgency. And Boone looks at me and he kind of smiles. Boone is the exact opposite of me. He's very quiet, very reserved, reads philosophy. That's no joke that, you know, that, that there was a statement from the movie where he's reading philosophy, all the heavens, all the hells. All. Boone read that stuff. I don't know why, it bored the crap out of me, but he loved it. I read comic books, that's how opposite we are. We're still best friends. But I remember he smiles at me and I say exactly what's on his mind. I said, man, we can do something fun tonight. We get our gear and we start to head out the door. And as we head out the door, you can see the consulate, and you can see the tracers, and you can see the orange going, you can see the green going, depending on the size of the round, whether it's a PKM round, which is like an M60, 240 Bravo, or it's an AK-47 round. You can hear the RPGs explode. You can hear the ch ch ch, -ch from, that's a dish guy, 50 cal. Ch -ch -ch. And you just know they're getting their butts handed to them, and we're watching it. And it's beautiful. <laughs> it's really quite, y'all gotta do that once. If, I know a lot of y'all have seen firefights in this room with all the veterans. If you haven't, grab a veteran and maybe put a mock firefight up, let him shoot. You guys just stand and just watch everything. It's beautiful, it's gorgeous. And I remember the team, and I remember seeing the team, and this is where leadership really showed itself. And it didn't show itself vocally. Leadership showed itself because Good leaders sometimes know when to shut the hell up and do their jobs. And that's what the whole team was doing. Everybody had a responsibility. Everybody was doing that responsibility. Not one buddy on the team, SEAL, Marine, Ranger, not any one of us was yelling at each other to do something else. There was no commands going on. Ty's going to go get his car. Tick's going to get the 40 millimeter. I'm going to go get my belt, my belt fit. And we're all just moving, getting all stuff ready. And it's beautiful. It's like a symphony. It's moving. All the Jason Bournes are running around the base with their heads cut off. <laughs> I laugh because I remember it. I remember it like, God, what a clown show. And we're all, and, and in five minutes, I remember walking out with all of our gear. Ty gives me a thumbs up because I'm walking in between them. His sedan's there. I'm driving the SUV. Boone has already got our SUV staged. And I'm walking because I'm the driver of the SUV. And I go like this back to Ty, which means we're ready, the cars are up. And I go to my chief, he's right here, and I go to my team leader who's right here, and I say, we're ready to go. And the chief says to the team leader, instead of to me, even though I'm saying, we're ready to go, he says, tell these guys they need to wait. And I remember the team leader actually had the gall to turn to me and said, you guys need, I said, I got it, I'm right here. And I walk back. And as I was walking back, I turned back around and I said, it's probably a good idea you get us a Spectre gunship and an ISR now. That was my first time I told my leadership to get us some support, 937. And then I walked back to my SUV. Ty says, what's going on? I said, Ty, he's on the radio. I said, Ty, Chief's telling us we got to wait. And it's hard. It's like I said, we swore that we'd help the guys. And we're watching them. We're watching them get their asses handed to them. They are. They're fired everywhere. It's just three quarters of a mile down the road. We can see it. And that's when we start hearing the radio go off. From the State Department guys, from Alec Henderson. GRS, consulate's been overrun. GRS, where are you? GRS, we are taking heavy fire. And you're just sitting there, not able to do a damn thing because your leadership is telling you, no, don't help. But inside, you're like, yes, it's time to help. We gotta go. Well, at the 15 minute mark from when we, we got called, that's when I see Tig, and he's pretty fed up. 
I see him get out of his car. He's in the sedan. He gets to the passenger side. Bob is on the driver's side. And I'm in my armored vehicle. I yell at each other, adamantly. And I remember Tig getting back in the car, and I said, what's going on? He says, Bob's telling us we've got to stand down. Now, I know the mainstream media, and I know you guys have a lot of that mainstream media out here in the Northwest. I know every one of them was on the base that night with us and swears up and down, there's no stand down order. You know, Rachel Maddow was in my trunk. But <laughs> I'm telling you, right? It was a stand down order. And the only reason I get like this, and I'm sorry, I, I'm a little bit bitter now because of what has been going on and people continue to spin. And we were there. We were told to stand down. You call Tig a liar, you're calling me a liar. You call us liars during firefights? Come on. <laughs> well, when he says that, Boone looks at me and goes, he's doing it again. Now, you folks don't know this. The consulate had been hit twice before 9-11-2012, and we couldn't respond to those attacks. Now, the only reason the consulate wasn't overrun those two attacks is because they were just probing. They were blowing holes in the wall to see if there would be a response, and there wasn't. And we tried to respond. We were told to not go, stand down, wait. Semantics, same thing. They're smart, terrorists are smart. They knew the ambassador was coming. For all y'all that are going into the military or going into some uh, government agency where there's classified information being everywhere, especially electronic media, do not use unsecure servers <laughs> to put up classified information. Right? And I'm not making that as a, I'm being ser deadly serious, obviously. They knew he was coming in. Like, well, let's see if we get a response. Oh, crap, we're not going to get a response. We got this three star general. We got Ambassador Chris Stevens coming in. 9 11, they know he's going to be there because he has to fly commercial air. We don't have government planes in Libya. We fly commercial air back and forth from Benghazi to Tripoli on Benghazi <laughs> or, or Libyan Airlines. So, and that's what it is, Al Libya, that's what it's called. So all they gotta do is just, oh, manifest, and there he is. Hey, guess what, he is coming in. We got him. Well, <clears throat> I remember looking at Boone and saying, yeah, we're gonna have to buck orders. Now, we knew at that point in time that if we did buck orders, that we would lose our jobs. We have this insurance and Jeff can tell you about it, to be on talking about it. Called Defense Base Act Insurance. Worst insurance in the world. <laughs> worse than all state, state farm, worse than all of them. I'm done, I'm kidding. For all you insurance agents here, I got state farm. <laughs> Defense Base Act Insurance has fine print everywhere in it. We know that if we go out of our normal scope of duties, which is by bucking orders, which is by leaving the CI Annex and going over to help with the consulate, we have no coverage. We get injured over there, Zero. We get killed over there, our family gets zero. You know, that's just, that's, that's man's guidelines. That's man's law. God's law has got to take over. And that's why I have that John 15, 13 on my shirt. So you all don't know what that is. Love is no greater than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. And it doesn't matter. And we know our families will, they know, they know that they will accept. And that we will, well, they know that they're going to accept what we do. They know that they, we're doing what we need to do. I knew that, now I'm, I'm not married anymore, but my ex-wife, I knew that she'd be okay with it. Cause she's like, yep, yeah, he's doing the right thing. And all of us thought that way about their wives and children. At the 25 minute mark, I remember hearing Alec Henderson, who is in the talk at the at State Department facility, watching it on the videos, watching it unfold for the last 30 minutes, watching basically his whole consulate get tore up and he barricaded himself in the talk there and watching guys run into the Ambo's villa starting to light that thing on fire. And he says, Dear us, if you don't get here, we're all going to F and die. See, it's a verbatim, same thing that's in the movie. Exactly. Those are the exact words. And that's when I saw Ty. And Ty's a big dude, West Coast Seals. These West Coast Seals guys can tell you. They're all going to go to Hollywood after. The West Coast Seals get huge. East Coast Seals, not so much. They're you know, West Coast. <laughs> No, I'm kidding, guys. But Ty is big. Ty's a big son. Ty's a bad dude. Miss that guy. 
But I remember he cracked his door and he went like this to me. And all I saw was this huge ham hock arm come out of the door. I'm like, yeah, let's go get some. This guy's going with me. And I remember I gave a thumbs up through my window. And we started to move. And as we're moving, I feel like I've lost my car keys. I do. I feel like I've lost something. I'm not I'm forgetting something. When you're in a combat situation or any crisis situations, you war game. Which you, you're going through every minute that goes by, the situation's changed. You're thinking, what do I got to do next? So the 25 minute mark is completely different than what I thought we needed at the five minute mark. And I realized we need our interpreter. Now, we have an interpreter on our base. His name's Henry. He's a linguist, he's not a combat terp. I've had combat terps in Iraq. Great guys. He carried cattle prods to get people out of the way. You know, you lose the force. You don't need to escalate shooter, but sometimes you got to move people and sometimes you got to move them quickly. Great guys. <laughs> The guy in Libya was not this. He was Egyptian, this tall, and he looked like Bob Newhart. Exactly. He was adorable. I did have to break up with him when we left. I loved Henry. He was so awesome. But I'm calling him on the radio. I'm going, we need our interpreter because I know we're going to connect with somebody. I know we're going to link up with the foreign force. I know it because we've done it. I know we're linking up with somebody. We don't speak Arabic well enough. We don't speak the language. You don't want a blue on green, which is a friendly fire it's with a foreign force. So I'm calling on the radio. I'm saying, Henry, we need you. Henry, we need you. Can't raise him. I'm disgusted. Gosh, we already wasted 25 minutes. Now I gotta go try to find Henry. And this is why I know God's with us at night, too. It's because as soon as I get out of my car, Henry's walking right there, right by my vehicle. And I say, Henry, and he knows. He knows what I'm going to ask him because he's crap, but he's soiling himself and his eyes are huge. I'm like, Henry, we need you, man. I said, we're going to be linking up with the indigenous force. I don't know how to speak Arabic well enough. None of us speak the language well enough. We need you. And he looks at me and he goes, Tom, I'm not a combat turp. I'm not weapons qualified. And he wasn't. And I remember I handed him my pistol. I said, you are now. Go get your stuff. <laughs> and it was amazing. It was amazing. It was courageous. So courageous. This Egyptian Bob Newhart, overweight, doesn't have any business going out with us, grabs my gun, and he goes back into building C. Now, initially, I thought I lost my gun. I was like, crap, he ain't coming back. But he comes back around, and he's got his helmet on backwards. He didn't know how to wear it. It wasn't his. His armor, actually, in the movie, looks like it fit him. It didn't fit him. It was too long. So he looked like a little turtle wearing a miniskirt. <laughs> But that, see, that's the things you see in combat people don't get. You know, you see, and I'm, I remember looking at him going, yeah, just laughing. I'm like, dude, you're adorable. Get in my car. <laughs> but I, I was so proud because this guy has no business. Could have told, say, hey, Tonto Pound Sand, I ain't going with y'all. Screw this. Didn't even argue. Took my gun, got his stuff, got in the car. I'm like, all right, let's go. And Ty headed out. Now, as we're driving down there, you know, it's, it's very surreal when you first start working in the Middle East because everybody still goes about their daily lives. A lot of you guys that have worked overseas, you know this. There's firefights going on. There's things going on, explosions and people. Still got to go get his shawarma. Still got to go get his chai. Still got to go get his baba ganoush. Still got to go to the grocery store across the street from the consulate. Even though there's a huge firefight going on. What I'm saying is people are still going about their normal lives. And we're driving through all this. It's easy to blend. You can kind of hide because you don't want to take off speed and you just follow everybody. But it, it is just like, wow. And that's how great we have it in this country. We don't have to worry about things like that. At least not yet. At least hope we don't. Well, <clears throat> we get down there and if you let, watch the mainstream media, they'll tell you that we drove all the way down there, picked some people up, drove back to the annex. We stopped 400 meters from the annex on Gunfighter Road. Road we were try to turn a right on and go to the main gate. And as we stop, there is a local force there. And they're jumping around. I equate it to, think of when I was a little kid, if I did this, where you have cats everywhere and you threw firecrackers at them, and they're jumping everywhere. That's what these guys were doing. And I remember Boone looking at me going, we waited 25 minutes for this? That was a rhetorical question. And we stop our car. There's one guy with a balaclava on a ski mask who has a PKM who's going around the corner of the main road. We got to go down to the front gate and he's going, and he's coming back. You know, they do that, come around, and then he comes and takes it, gets in the prone, shoots a little bit, and then he jumps back. So we're like, these guys are taking fire. And we get out of our car. As soon as you get out of the car, we're at the corner, we're supposed to make a right. 
you start hearing snaps, snap, 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 like a wood cracking. And then all of a sudden you hear like a two by four crack behind you. Now what that is, and it's pretty awesome, I said, to get some people to shoot at you. A high, it's a high velocity round that goes by your head and breaks a sound barrier. So that's what you're hearing. Snap. Now that two by four cracking is if a bullet, a good sized bullet hits behind you on any kind of solid surface, it sounds like there's a two by four going. So that's what we're hearing. We're getting shot at. And we're like, yeah, let's do this. And again, the beauty of this team, nobody panics. Nobody starts barking orders, everybody starts moving. And I see Ty and Jack start moving to the corner of the wall, start shooting. I see Tig with her 40 millimeter. I hear him crack the breech, put a 40 mic mic in there, 40 millimeter grenade. Foom. You count three, boom. And it's awesome. It's, it's, it is it's awesome. And I see Boone. Boone is our best shooter. He's our sniper. He says, Tana, we gotta get high. So I knew what he wanted to do. There was abandoned buildings on the back side of the consulate. We were gonna sneak through backyards. And so we started to jump walls. And I do remember grabbing a couple locals that I couldn't, I just could tell, I, I can trust these guys. And I remember Boone says, man, why are you taking these guys with us? I'm like, hey bro, four's a fire team. We need more people. And we just start jumping. It took us 30 minutes to fight our way on to the consulate that 400 meters. So by the time we actually got on the consulate, it had been over an hour. And that's since we got called, and we're the last ones to get called. You know, we're not the first responders. That's what they told us, always. When we get on that compound, I remember climbing over that back gate, and this is why I love the movie. Now, I love American Sniper. Yeah, American Sniper's okay. Lone Survivor, great movie. Black Hawk Down, great movie. We Were Soldiers, great movie. But they always show wars being kind of dull and dingy, the colors. It's not. The colors are bright, vivid, it's, everything pops. And I love that that's, I told Michael that. I remember seeing it and saying, hey Mike, when you show the consulate and you show that green grass, you gotta make it look like the master's course on a great day. You gotta show that green, you gotta show that fires. And Michael Bay is the perfect guy for that because he utilizes colors. And that's what it looks like, it's beautiful. It is, as long as you take the time and you enjoy why you're there. And I did, I enjoyed it. God had me in that position. If I died on that battlefield that day, then I died at peace with him, but I'm happy I'm there because that's where I'm supposed to be. And it, you can enjoy life. You can do that in anything in life. Just enjoy what's going on around you. Even if it's the worst thing in the world, enjoy it. And you'll see colors and, and experience things you never would experience before. And I remember seeing all that. Well, for the next hour, we run around on this anchor compound, clearing buildings, trying to push off the bad guys, finding all the survivors, and we find four survivors, and we end up linking back up at Villa C, which is where we made our capturing collection point at, which was the ambassador's villa. Ty is doing awesome, and so was Jack. They're both running in and out of that burning building with TIG, and it's so hot, and it, it sucked. I remember taking my turn to go in there. It felt like you're going into a pizza oven filled with diesel fumes. And if we would have showed the movie actually what we could see when we're going into that burning building, you would have just saw a black screen. You wouldn't have saw anything. And it got to the point where we would actually have to just tag hands. One guy would run in and just feel around as best he could and then follow the sound of the voices to get out. And we almost lost Ty in that. We actually had to, John actually, John and Jack actually had to go grab him and get him out. Well, while that's going on, I remember running back and taking security outside the villa and Boone comes up and says, we lost one. And I said, who we lose? He goes, the IT guy. I was like, hey, IT guy, who's IT guy? I asked Sean Smith. And all I thought in my head was, I wasn't upset, I wasn't angry. It was, damn, he just got here two days ago. <laughs> it's war. And I remember Boone is upset. Boone doesn't get upset. And he's yelling. He's like, just would have let us go five minutes early. If we just would have left it when we wanted to leave, he'd still be alive. And he's starting to lose it. He's starting to get angry. And I said, Sergeant, <laughs> I said, Sergeant, get it together. And he's awesome. He's a warrior. Like that, he's back in it. He's like, okay, got it. I'm back here. Control. And I remember going to the front of the villa and I see Jack and I see Dave Ubin pulling Sean's body out of the window. And I see him sit, Sean, lay Sean's body down by the stairs. And Sean's dead. It's obvious. And I see Scott Wickland, who was with the ambassador, who lost control of him that night. I'm not blaming this guy. Man, that guy was, he didn't know if anybody was coming. He's basically watching himself get burned alive. I don't blame Scott at all. 
Well, he's sitting there, and he's kind of going into shock, and I see Jack look up, and I see Jack do something remarkable. He starts to try to do uh, resuscitations, chest compressions on Sean, even though Sean's dead. And people are like, well, why did he do that? I know why he was doing that. This guy's going into shock. He's trying to stay positive. That's freaking awesome. This says a lot for the SEAL community. This says a lot for the special ops community. Like, look what this guy's doing. He's thinking outside the box. And every time he tries to do a chest compression, he looks up at Scott and he says, stay with me, dude, we're still in this fight. Stay with me, stay with me. And it works. I mean, Sean's dead, he doesn't come back, but Scott comes back. Because if Scott's a casualty, we only got six guys, so we don't need another casualty. And that's when Ty comes over, and Ty and Jack both tell Scott, Scott, get it together. All right, he's dead. We're still got a long night ahead of us. And we pick up Sean's body, it was actually taking Jack, and they pick up Sean's body and they put it in the back of our SUV that our team leader, Staffer, who's in charge of us, who has zero military years experience, drove up after we cleared the consulate. So we put it back in his SUV, and when we do that, I remember I started moving. It's about 11.30, 11.45 now, and there's a big explosion. Now there's Libyans everywhere on the base now. You don't know who's who. They're everywhere. It's like Nebraska when the tornado sirens go off. People are supposed to go hide in the basements. I work, live in Nebraska. We don't do that. When the tornado sirens go off, we come and look where the tornado is, right? <laughs> it's a firefight in Libya or the Middle East. Nobody goes and hides. They're all like, well, what's going on? What's going on? So there's people everywhere on the base. And when this explosion goes off, I see this Libyan run by. I mean, his hand, this, what used to be his hand, is gone. He's missing it. And I look at another Libyan, and it's just instinctive. I go, what happened? I don't know if he speaks English at all. And the Libyan goes, grenade. And they run off, and as they're running off, all I can think of in my head was, son of a gun, don't try to cook a grenade off then and throw it at us. Rub some dirt on it. You'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, that's, we still got a long, we're not even midnight yet. We got a long night ahead of us. <laughs> well, <clears throat> second explosion goes off, and then the water faucet turns on. Snaps everywhere. Snaps happening, going everywhere. And I remember I took cover behind the only thing I could see was an SUV. And I went behind the engine block and I just started shooting. That gate had been left open by a commander that was supposed to be with the 17th February that said he had the cell phone number to the bad guys. And I tried to get in a fight with him about it, but we didn't have time. He left the back gate open and I told him to close it. Getting counterattacked and it's lighting up. And as I'm shooting, somebody honks a horn at me. So I'm leaning like this. And somebody honks a horn at me. And I look, I'm like, who the hell is honking a horn at me? And I take, I'm taking cover behind the State Department guy's vehicle. They want to get out of there. They don't care if Tano has any cover or anything. And so I look at Scott. I step back, and just like a country boy from Nebraska, which I am, I just come on and say, come on. And they drove. And as I drove, I took a knee. And I just started shooting again. And I just said, him go right. And I see him go right again. And in my head, I'm going, Ty and Jack just told you guys to not go right when you left the compound. And I could hear Ty and Jack on the radio going, you guys are going the wrong way. Now, why they were saying that, you guys don't know this either. Not only was the consulate basically indefensible, not only did they have a terrorist organization living on the compound with them, it was built 200 meters from an Ansaucheria safe house, which was the group that attacked the compound that night. So they go right, <clears throat> Jack and Ty are going the wrong way and we couldn't do anything for them because we're in our own fight and I'm shooting and I got no cover. I wish I had as much cover as Michael Bay showed in the movie, I didn't have any. But all I can think about is I gotta fire, I gotta keep firing or else they're gonna come through that back gate and they're gonna overwhelm us. And as I'm doing that, my right ear drum blows out and it hurts and I look and there's this Libyan that looked like he just got off work from like Mitchell Obama, Bank of America. Looked like he had nice slacks, but no, sure. Looked like he just threw his jacket off. Took a knee by me, and he was shooting with me. I was like, holy shit, this is the damnedest thing. God just put a little Libyan angel right next to me. Too comfort. <laughs> and my team leader, the guy, the guy that has no military experience, he's calling me on the radio, going, "Tom, take cover." And I'm thinking, "Get your butt out here and help me." And as I think that. Boom, comes screaming around the corner, and he takes a knee on the other side of me. And he knows I'm gonna run out of ammo. I'm not wearing a big plate. I know the movie shows me wearing a big plate carrier. I was wearing shorts that night. I still got those shorts. It's hot over there, man. You know, fight, be comfortable. You don't need all that extra cloth. But 
I don't have anything up front. I have this little soft armor with a 10 inch chicken plate about this big right here. And Boone knows I'm running out of ammo. He knows who I am. We've been working together forever. He's already got a magazine in his right hand. He throws it to me across the road. I put my magazine in, reload. He takes a knee and he starts. Take it climbed up on the villa that's on fire to just get a better fighting position. That team, like I said, you just don't find teams like that very often. It's incredible. I was like, man, that's, that's, dude, look at this. Well, we ended up fighting off the counterattack. Luckily for us, none of them were trying to jump the walls, and they were all trying to come through that little choke point, kind of like 300, <laughs> the little choke point of travel. An RPG gunner comes around the corner too many times, and he tries to shoot again, and they nail him, he falls. RPG tube falls, and it's like a water faucet just turned off. Nothing. We knew we had to get out of there. We finally got an ISR. We have an ISR on station. ISR says there's people massing, a drone, a UAV. We gotta get back to the annex, and that's when we made the decision to leave right around midnight. We left, we got back to the annex, and it still bothered me the day that we did this because we left somebody behind. We left the ambassador. Now, we didn't know he was there. We didn't. We tried so many times to find him in that safe room. Just so much smoke, so much heat. We almost lost time trying to find him. So we figured, well, he, obviously he got kidnapped. He's, he's not here. Well, he was found later in the morning at one, on, on his bed, half on the floor, which is where the safe room was. And we left him. Never leave a fallen comrade fall in the hands of, fall in the, hands of the enemy, and we did. And it, I know it still bothers me a lot. Well, <clears throat> that's how it goes. It's war. That's how it is. We get back to the annex, and when we get back to the annex, I see something that sickens me and what a leader should never do. Our chief is sitting in the middle of our main building, our building C at the annex, and he's got his head in his hands. He's sitting on the floor. Everybody can see him. And his elbow is on his knees, and it looks like he's defeated. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And I had found a Blackberry at the, at the consulate in the, in the villa. And I threw it at him. I said, this might be the ambassadors. And that's when he was like, man, this is just, this leadership that we have here, it's done. And we stopped listening to our staffers. Well, we start to get moved on about one o'clock. And I, I'm not going to go through a lot of it. Read the book, watch the movie. The movie did a fantastic job showing it. I mean, it was very accurate. What I want to point out is why they're moving on us on this first attack at the annex is that we're watching them and they're doing things that terrorists do. They're utilizing houses that we know have children in them. We're not going to shoot those houses up. I wanted to, believe me, I did. It's like, God, I got this belt fed. I just want to tear that thing up. No, there's kids in there. And they're moving towards us as they're getting closer. I remember calling my chief several times going, Chief, are we expecting any friendlies? Chief, are we expecting any friendlies? T.O., are we expecting any friendlies? I don't know. I don't know. Well, they're getting closer. They're 30 meters from Oz's position. And once I hear that, Boone says, I got an AK. And then I see a fizz come across the back of the fence. Like a stick of dynamite from a Wiley e. Coyote cartoon. <laughs> and it lands. I think, well, thank God that's going to miss everybody. And as I look down to see where it lands, I see Tig running by it. I'm like, why the hell is Tig out of position? And it's just boom. And that's just our indicator to start shooting. And we got our defenses put up. We know how to defend the annex. We train to do that. We have an SOP for it, standard operating procedure. And we're good. And we just start lighting people up. Very easy. It's like playing whack-a-mole. Just whack that guy goes down. He goes down. He goes down. It may be insensitive. I could care less. I like to shoot terrorists. I do. Okay? Yeah. I know people... It's not, it's not insensitive. And we didn't start it. We didn't. And that doesn't matter anyway. Just don't attack us. <laughs> then you'll have a problem. Well, it only takes us about five minutes, really. It's really short. It was just a probing force. And we fight them off. And then I see Tig, because I'm thinking, well, I'm going to have to go pick up Tig's body now, because it's probably in pieces. And he's up on his fighting position. I'm like, holy crap, this guy's Superman. What happened? Well, he got hit with what's called a gelatina bomb. A gelatina bomb is basically a big flash bang, just big lights. And it, it did, I mean, it did wreck him like on the inside a bit, a lot of overpressure. But there's no shrapnel in it. And he was alive. What they use it for is they use it for fishing. They drop it in the Mediterranean, blows up, fish come up. It's Mediterranean redneck fishing. That's really what it's for. <laughs> 
But I remember seeing Tig, I'm like, oh good, he's still alive, and we keep moving on. Three o'clock, we get hit again. And I remember during that time frame, I'm requesting air support, saying, where's our air support? Where's our spectrum? Are you getting us anything? Well, three o'clock, we get hit again, and this is a more, a, a more uh, substantial force, 40, 50 guys. I know there's been reports of maybe there was 100, maybe there was 200. Nighttime plays tricks on your eyes. I don't think there's any more than 40. And they're moving from the same position again, and we're just waiting. And this time, we're just waiting. And a guy drives up in a car, and we are so lucky and blessed that they didn't bring a VBID, a vehicle borne infrared explosive device, to our walls, because we couldn't have defended that. I don't know why they didn't. I'm glad they didn't. But they did have a, truck, a car drive up close to the gate. A guy jumped out of the car to try to throw a grenade. And I see Oz, and I see Boone shoop, zip him up, and it's on again. And it is. It's like I'm back in Nuclear after Prairie Dog Shoot. <laughs> Zipping people up. That one was printed a little bit longer, probably 10, 15 minutes. And during that whole time, we're getting calls from our chief on the radio and our team leader saying, hey, stop shooting, you're shooting at 17 Feb. I'm like, they're shooting at us. Tell them to stop shooting us, we'll start shooting at them. And that's when, you know, Boo is like 17 Feb my ass. And he gets up and just starts knocking guys down with a sniper rifle. Boone did a fantastic job and it was very, very motivating to watch him just crack, crack. But he also was having fun with me. And this is fun. This is the fun part. <laughs> he, my ear is right next to his, that, sorry, that, that, I almost told you what it was, that sniper rifle right here. And I'm not wearing hearing pro. And every time he shoots, it hurts my ear. So I move. He thinks it's funny. So every time I move down, he shifts with me. And he's laughing. <laughs> People are like, oh, that, that's the kind of stuff that happens. It is. And then when we're done, he goes, the best stupid line I've ever heard. I said, man, you're a hole. I can't hear out of this here now. And he goes, casualty of war, Tono. Arr, arr, arr. He walks away. <laughs> I love that knucklehead. Well, we get word now Glenn is coming. West Coast Seal. Great guy. I worked with him in Tripoli. Glenn is a hero. Glenn, if you don't know this, Glenn and his team. They got money and they chartered an oil executive's plane to get to us. They paid money. Now they traveled in style, leather seats and everything. No U.S. assets were there in Tripoli. So they figured out a way, they, and that's special ops for you right there. Figure out a way to get it done. This is what you have. And he did. They get to us. Will didn't, little did we know that they had been there since midnight, but since we had no friendly militias and we had no military support, and nobody on his team or the two Delta guys that were with him knew where our, our uh, annex were, it took them five hours to figure out to go how to get to us for that 10 miles. So it's five o'clock in the morning, and, and we're tired. The whole team's spent. We're tired. We've been through a lot. And I hear Bub come across the road, and he goes, guys, I cannot find your front gate. I don't know where it's at. You know, Siri and Google don't know where the hell you're at. And I remember, I remember thinking, okay, I got to mark the gate. But I also remember thinking, gosh, I got to say something funny. I got to say a joke. I can feel the team start to get tense. Because I, I got tense too. I think, okay, I'll say something. I said, it's going to be inappropriate, but I'll say it. So I said, Roger that, bub. Get on your night vision. I'm going to lasso the front gate, lasso the target. So I get with my night vision on my rifle. I get my IR laser up. And I go, shh, shh, shh. I start going. And he says, I see it. And that's when I say, Roger that. And I get on the radio and I go, guys, I don't know if this is an awkward time to tell you or not, but I've had to take a crap since we left the concert. <laughs> I did. That's why it was so funny. I had to. Five hours. You guys been in firefights. It's tough. I know it is. Try doing two firefights with a turtle head poking out the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't kidding. <laughs> Somebody's going to write me up wrong. I, I, I got somebody in Iowa wrote me up and said, great speech, but he talked about poop, so I'm sorry if you're... <laughs> See, that's what people don't get, though. That's just, that's how it is with the guys. And I could hear Jack laughing on his building. I could hear Boone giggling, and I looked at him, and he's just going like this. You do that to keep each other going. You have fun. You're having a good time. You're with guys that you love, and you, you want to fight with. Well, Bub comes in, and he's the only one out of that whole group that came in with that militia. And it's funny. It's very ironic. That militia that escorted Bub's team to us and then also saved us that whole night from there on out were Qaddafi loyalists. 
they're the guys that the administration and the Secretary of State were bombing and taking out of power. They saved us. <laughs> well, I remember they come in, Bub comes in, everybody goes inside Villa C except for Bub. He went up on top to see Ty, up on building, they were buddies. So they're up on building C. So you got Ty, Bub, Oz, and Dave up on building C, Dave Ubin. And after about a couple minutes, I hear, now I can't hear. My hearing actually is supposed to wear hearing aids. It's very pleasant not being able to hear things in the world sometimes. But I remember thinking, it didn't sound like a mortar. And I went on the road, I go, did you hear that? And then it just hit me. I'm like mortars, mortars. And then the third mortar, I just see it hit. And it's, I'm about from here to probably the middle of the room is where the first mortar hit. Bam, and it hit right over the backside of Villa C where Ty, Glenn, Dave, and Oz were. And I see Ty, he's got a belt fed. And it's still early morning in Uncle Twilight. He's still got his night vision on. And he holds that trigger down. And I just see him go, shh, just start zipping. I mean, it looks like a laser. He's just chewing people up. And it's awesome. And I see Oz, and I see Bub, and I see Dave shooting their M4s. And I'm putting rounds over their head. I can't see the bad guys because they're coming attacking from a, a place that I can't see because Oz's position is blocking it. Oz and Ty's and Glenn's. But I'm putting rounds over their head because of the snaps. And then I think, crap, mortars are coming this way. If we were doing that, we'd get attacked from this way. So I'm thinking, I'm going to turn around in any second, I'm going to see 500 Ansar Al Sharia guys jumping our walls. So I take a shot, I look, there's nobody coming. So I come back around, I shoot some more. And I see another mortar hit, 81 millimeter, boom. Dave's out. Dave says, I'm hit. Trapped on his face, on the ground. Self-8, ain't got time for buddy eight. We don't know. I turn back around again, nobody's coming. As I come back around for the third time, and put a couple of rounds, I see boom, 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 and all I see is actually is white. Night vision whites out. All that ambient light has just got overwhelmed within the system of those MVGs, night vision. And as my night vision comes back, I see pixie dust. So what you see is you just saw, or what I just saw, is I just saw my whole team get obliterated. I just, I, to me, it looked like they were evaporated. All I saw were dust. And that was the one time that night where I actually did put my, I didn't put my head down. I went, I can't beat this, we got no air support. And then God, or Jiminy Cricket, <laughs> kicked me in the back of the head, said, get your gun up. Roger that, boom, stop shooting again. We got three guns left. I could hear tires screeching and I could hear a firefight about the direction the mortars were coming, I don't know, a mile or so away. That was the Gaddafi loyalists that had escorted Bub's team to us taking out that mortar team. Why did they do it for us? Their commander got caught in building C. He came in to talk to the chief and then the mortar started hitting. <laughs> God has a sense of humor sometimes. <laughs> well, I remember seeing Tig get up on that roof and I see Oz get up and I didn't know it was Oz, but I saw a guy get up, try to shoot, and every time he tries to shoot, his arm falls, or his gun falls, keeps falling, his rifle, poof. And it was Oz. Oz, all he could think about was, I gotta get my gun back in the fight. He's been hit by three 81 millimeter mortars, three of them, he's still alive. But his arm is like this. So he doesn't realize he doesn't have his off hand anymore. So every time he brings his gun up, and he tries to bring his off hand up, because he's in shock, it falls because he has no support. But he didn't realize it, until Tick gets up there. And Tick sits him down. That's, I mean, now granted, I want you to keep in mind here, we are far for effect with mortars. Mortars are dead shot, and Tick, doesn't think twice. He's already up on that building, knowing the mortars are locked in. Now, we don't know if the mortars are going to keep coming or not. But he's already up there. He sits Oz down, and Oz keeps doing this. <laughs> Tig was getting so pissed off because there was a little tendon that was going to pop off. Tig gets a tourniquet on, and Oz keeps doing this. And Tig getting fired up. He says, why did you stop playing with your arm? It's going to pop off. And I remember talking to Tig in Germany. I said, Dad, how did you get him to stop playing with that thing? He goes, I told him if he kept playing with it, he'd go blind. <laughs> All right, okay, I have to admit, that's a Dirty Ranger joke. I'll smile you. What he did is the Delta guys got up there and then Tig were up there and they gave, and this is, this is how, this is how we are. This is how we are with the training. This is how you come through in training. This is how you're overseas. When you're in pain or something's hurting you, give that guy a task. And that's what he did. 
That's what Tig and the Deep Boys did. They said, Oz, can you get down from here? And Oz came back. I, was, I guess I'm going to have to. And Oz, and every step I could hear Oz with one leg, with one arm, coming down the ladder, just how much pain, oh, every tip. I was like, God dang it. At least he's alive. Tig goes over to Ty. Ty's dead. Fetal, posi fetal position. Bubba's dead. Face down. Dave Ubin has his arm blown off, hanging by a tendon, and his legs almost blown off. It's hanging by you know, a couple pieces of skin. And Tig gets over there, puts tourniquets on Dave too. And the D-Boys help get Dave down. Well, coming through the end here, folks. In the morning, I finally get word, and then later in the morning, about 6, 6.30, Chief and the team leaders say, Tana, we got a militia coming. I need to make sure you're friendlies. And I said, oh, great. Thanks, Chief. OK, fantastic. What do they look like? And Chief says, I don't know. I said, roger that. OK, what, do you know what kind of vehicles they have? Well, it's going to be 40 to 50 possibly technicals. And OK, great. Well, at least I know it's a technical a truck with a big machine gun in the back that can blow over the wall. I said, do you know what color their trucks are? No. OK, do they have markings on their trucks? No, I have no idea. What are they wearing uniforms? We don't know. Roger that. How do I communicate with them? Do I have any comms with them? No, you have none. I said, Chief, how am I supposed to stop these guys? I have an M4. If they're not good guys, he goes, I don't know. He's like, Roger that. Thanks for pearls of wisdom. <laughs> I did, and I you know he thought I was a smart ass all night. Well, he didn't like me anyway. But obviously, <laughs> don't fall asleep during an ambassador's talk. The Chief doesn't like you when you do that. <laughs> Well, I remember seeing that, seeing a huge ass motorcade coming. It's huge. And I remember striving, and I, I don't know if they're good guys. And I remember the movie did it perfect. Pablo Schreiber got picked early on in the process, so I got to become real good friends, and we got to know each other very well. He got my personality down to a T. I'm better looking than he is, but <laughs> he did get the personality down to a T. And I remember. If you watch the movie again, when that motorcade's coming, you see Pablo take his helmet off and go massive heavy forward. Now, I didn't take my helmet off. I didn't. I mean, no, I don't want to get shot in the head. Granted, it's a 50 cal. It's going to rip me apart anyway. But I remember I did feel like that. I was like, damn, look at this. I said, this is it. I said, one of us or them. He said, I'm going to take somebody out. And I remember I got down behind my parapet, and I put my red dot right on the driver, on uh, the passenger's of the front vehicle, passenger side. And I'm thinking, how am I going to signal these guys? And I'm thinking, Jumbo. I learned the Jumbo from the Sudanese when I worked in Mosul. I worked in some of the greatest places. It was beautiful. <laughs> Beachfront properties, all these places. <laughs> well, Sudanese, it's the same thing. Shaka, Jumbo, hang loose, same thing. It's the same thing. And every time I would drive by, because the Sudanese would protect our base, they're out on our exterior gates, they would always go, Jumbo, Tano, Jumbo. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? And they're like, it means be cool. And so I would start to do it in towns and all these places I worked in. Kirkuk and Kandahar and Kabul and Kobe and actually I got it back when I got it back normally that meant hey these guys are friendly so I said well, I'll do the jumbo so I go and I I'm, I know I'm gonna get ripped in half and I go and I see the guy in the front vehicle he's chewing cot which is Copenhagen mixed with steroids and cocaine is basically what cot is. <laughs> and it turns your mouth all brown and yellowish and it, and I see him go like this, and I see him start to smile. Now, <laughs> I've had two beautiful ex-wives. <laughs> I've had data some beautiful women, beautiful smiles. That is the most beautiful smile I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I get on the radio, go, they're here. This guy's got it. And that's when Boone comes up to me and Boone, me and Boone, and he goes, you could use these guys at 9.30, right? And I go, roger that. Well, we, start to exfil. This last part I do want to tell you because to this day the CIA and the NSFCIA and the State Department still have it written incorrectly in their reports and they still stand by what they told their families to their face that Ty and Glenn's bodies were handled with care. They weren't. And as we're leaving I remember seeing the deep boys get up there and I, 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 I don't know what they were thinking. Great guys. I, in fact there's more to the story in this. If I had more time I'd tell you. I respect the guys for what they did and what they stood up for. They got caught in a political, political fray with this, the Delta guys. But they got, got up on the roof, and for some reason, they pushed Ty's body off, and you see Ty, boom. 
I'm gonna tell you what it looks like when a body hits concrete from that far up. And then they, before all of us were just kind of in shock, like what in the world? And then you see him do with Glenn's body, and Glenn actually caught a branch on the way down, right? And he hits, and you just, <laughs> what's, this is par for the course tonight, isn't it? And I was in Yemen, and then after eight months of signing multiple non-disclosures and going to a memorial ceremony for Ty and Glenn and, making, and the CIA making us sign new non-disclosures again at the memorial ceremony for Ty and Glenn, the team came together and said, this is enough, we've had it. And we all voted as a team to tell the story. We wrote the book, the book came out. Now, first of all, we had to get an actual writer because you have a Marines and SEALs and Rangers writing a book. It was a pop-up book. <laughs> Put that RPG go, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> So we had to get someone to help us. But the book was written. It went through clearance processes. We did it. We turned it in for review. And it came out. And when it came out, you know, I was no longer in the shadows, per se. I became something I didn't ever want to become. I said I'd never become one of those guys that wrote a book that's in the spotlight. I didn't want to ever do it. But I know it was necessary. I knew it was, we had to do it. But I hated my life and I was going to kill myself after that Brett Bear special probably two weeks after. Going into Dallas and we had a big Barnes & Noble book signing. A lot of people showed up and I was like, my life sucks. It's terrible. I want to do this. Just end it. And as I was standing in the Dallas airport, I remember this lady comes up to me, and she's about this tall. And she looks at me, and she goes, are you Tano? I'm like, yeah. I'm like here we go again. Yeah, I'm Tano. You're Chris, you're Benghazi? I said, yeah, yeah, that's me. She goes, I believe you. Keep telling your story. That little incident just flipped that switch. Like, oh, maybe this country is as bad as I thought it was. And I said, well, maybe this is what the Lord has me on. This is the path I'm supposed to be going on. And she changed my life right there. And I didn't want to kill myself anymore. Now, I'll be honest with you. Every day I get done telling the story, like after this, when I walk out of here today, I'm like, that's the last time I'm going to say it. And then I remember seeing all the smiling faces and everybody that still believes in us. And I see the patriotism that I thought was dead that isn't. It's still alive and well. It just needs to come up. <laughs> You guys have been great I'm taking a lot of your time and closing I don't, all I want to say is don't don't tell me thank you you folks being here today you save my life every day you make me want to go on to the next day so please I'm saying thank you to you folks thank you to having me here Debbie and God bless y'all I really appreciate it that God sent an angel to you that day at the airport. So, um, thank you so much. Oh, Henry. Henry is still alive and well. He was attached to Jack at the hip that whole night. Jack was watching over him. Uh, really, Jack was. He was just, Jack was with him. He said, Henry, stay with Jack. And Jack took care of him. Henry still is working. Henry's working. Henry, I love the guy. He knows a lot, but they will lose their jobs if they talk. And Henry needs his job. And I love that guy anyway. I mean, any animosity. He's still alive and he's still working. Um, the, the gentleman, there was another interpreter though. In the movie, the interpreter is two guys. It's Henry and Amal. We had two. Amal, I don't know what happened to Amal. He might be dead. I have no idea. Okay? Roger. Thank you. Um, signing books and those that I took out of line um, you are the first person the first to be si um, getting your book signed so if someone says I'm ahead of you understand that because I made him get out of line and we have our drawing